Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone. For the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan. I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is is exalted among the children of man. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Let's go to him in prayer. O Lord, our God, make your word a swift word, passing from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip and conversation, that as the rain returns not empty, so neither may your word, but accomplish that for which it is given, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So the saying goes, if you find the perfect church, don't join it. You'll ruin it. And, and yet we join anyway, don't we? <laughs> this side of glory, no church is perfectly pure because, well, you already know, we're sinners. Saved only by God's grace through faith in Christ. Whether a church is faithful, and that is one that you should join, rests not on the perfection of its members. Thank God, right? But it rests on that the gospel be preached and taught and embraced. That the ordinances be administered and that public worship be performed. As our confession defines it, the church is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of salvation. But universally speaking, that is the church universal, there we see historically that there are some times in which the church is more visible and sometimes when it is less visible. And we also see with local churches, that is particular churches, that there are times when the church is less pure and more pure. Any student of church history knows that the Westminster Assembly got it right when they said this. Listen closely. The purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. And some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, there shall be always a church on earth to worship God according to His will. In other words, if you are worried that there will be a day when the church will not be, don't be. But... If you are concerned that there will be a day when the local church could degenerate into a synagogue of Satan, be concerned about that. It's happened before. There have been times in history where the church taught other things, perhaps noble things, but not the gospel. There have been times when the church has embraced things and promoted things, good things, but not the gospel. There have been times when the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism have been treated as well as merely liturgical ordinances rather than means of grace ordinances. 
There have been times when public worship has been, well, it's been nothing more than just a spectator event or entertainment events rather than the reverent worship of the Lord our God. And when it happens... What happens to the church is the church no longer sees sinners saved and saints sanctified. But instead, the church devolves into a graceless and therefore a godless state of irrelevance. The church no no longer matters. The impact of this sad state... Well, you know it to be true. It radiates well beyond the walls of the church building. A culture without faithful churches in word, sacrament, and prayer becomes a dark culture. Because a church without the means of grace means that there are few, if any, Christians who are within the culture. It means that there is no one in the culture who is salt and light. This, of course, is a clarifying reminder. We need to consistently be reminded to keep the focus on the gospel. To preach the word. To administer the sacraments. To be faithful in gathering in worship. And that our worship be pure. Because, to put it simply, no church No Christians, no salt and light. Darkness indeed. But my question for you and related to this psalm is, what if a culture were so devoid of the godly that you looked around and it seemed like you were all alone? How would it feel? And what would you do? Well, David... In Psalm 12, feels like he is the last man standing. In verse 1, he says, in essence, the godly have disappeared. People of integrity have vanished. I I think of, of Elijah's lament. We think back to when Elijah had called Israel to repentance. And you remember when God rained down fire from heaven with the miraculous. And you remember that after Elijah had, has exposed the religion of Baal as a fraud, he receives a death threat from the queen. And he runs for his life. And he says this to God. He says, I have been very jealous for the Lord The God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, Elijah said, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Of course, Elijah's self-pity clouded his judgment, as it always does. But God in His grace answered him, explaining I still have left 7,000 followers in Israel who have not bowed their knees to Baal or kissed the images of him. And it it was the truth. Elijah felt like he was the last godly person alive. And so does David. And perhaps you too know how David feels. Perhaps you too can relate to Elijah. Maybe not our culture at large, but in your own circumstances. When you live a life for the Lord in this fallen world, you are sure to be alienated. You are sure to be ostracized for your Christian devotion. Maybe you're a student and maybe it's at school. Or maybe it's in your workplace. Or maybe it's in your family. But if you live long enough and bold enough, you will experience it. And so what do you do? 
What do you do in your circumstances when you feel like, I'm it? The godly are gone, and in my circumstances, I'm the only one left. Don't go it alone, because you're not. Instead, cry out like David, praying for God's provision. Cry out to the Lord like David. God, I feel like I'm the last one. And in my circumstances, I need your provision. Our shorter catechism gives us an answer of what prayer is. It says, prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will in the name of Christ with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of His mercies. And I love the first part of that. And I lo- Well, I love the whole answer, actually, right? But I love the first part of that because it reminds me that I am to bring my desires to God. And you pause for a second and you think, is that right? Am I supposed to bring my desires, present my desires unto God? It sounds a bit selfish, doesn't it? I mean, why should I pray for my desires when I should be praying for you? You need prayer. (laughs) And yet, in the 37th Psalm, David says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and I will give you the desires of your heart. You see, unlike the unregenerate, The child of God prays to our Heavenly Father, desiring not the things of the flesh, but those things which please God. Asking that He help us when we feel all alone is a pleasing petition. Because God is most glorified when we are most dependent upon Him. What we must avoid at all costs is self-pity and a victim mentality. Because self-pity and a victim mentality is contrary to the gospel. It clouds our perspective of God's providence and it also stymies us in our growth in grace. Instead, when you are persecuted for your faith, when you feel like you are ostracized because of your faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you feel like you're the last one standing, set your mind on this truth. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. When the godly are gone, we must not cower in fear or defeat, but look to the Lord, offering up our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will, knowing as David did, that the Lord is our keeper and will guard us from evil. Today and forever. But the other thing that I want us to consider, and it's in relation to this, in this psalm, is what happens to speaking the truth when the godly are gone? What happens to speaking the truth when the godly are gone? What happens to words and their meaning when the faithful seem to have, been, have vanished from the land? Without the presence of those who are led by the Holy Spirit, living according to the truth of His Word, one of the characteristics that a culture will experience is the deterioration of substantive communication and the influence of propaganda. Commentator Derek Kidner puts it a little more simply. He says, here's what you see when the godly are gone from a culture. Empty talk, smooth talk, double talk that manipulates rather than communicates. David listens to those around him and all he hears are flattering 
lips and a double heart. Deception and hypocrisy are hidden behind the words that are spoken. To accept and and to, to adapt to this communication is to demean the truth. And yet, the wicked argue in verse 4, With our tongues we will prevail, and our lips are with us. (laughs) And the world of the wicked, through their words, what they're saying is, is the end justifies the means. It's okay that I don't tell the truth. It's okay that I lie. It's okay that I flatter Because I've got an objective, and I'm going to get that objective done. But when lying is justified as strategy, and flattery is justified as influence, you can be sure that a heart for God is as far away as possible. What they say reveals whom they really serve. As verse 4 confirms, we... We are our own masters. We'll say what we want, when we want, to get what we want. Who is master over us? When the truth is not told, it is disturbing to every child of God. Unless their conscience has been, has been so compromised, unless a believer's conscience has been so crushed, so compromised that, well... They're just used to the propaganda. They accept it. That's how people talk. The Apostle Peter says, giving the example of Lot, he says that when Lot was living in Sodom among the wicked, and he uses the expression day after day, meaning day after day, Lot was just exposed to this in Sodom. Peter says that his righteous soul was tormented over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. This is a really good expression of what happens to the believer. When the believer is in a culture where lies and flattery are the form of promotion, are the form of communication, and propaganda wins, the believer's soul is tormented. And when we find ourselves among the wicked, while everyone around us seems content with the words that are spoken, the believer is tormented. But over time, over time, the absence of truth-telling can wear you down, compromising your conscience, crippling your walk contaminating your perspective, even grieving the Holy Spirit. Torment indeed. And David, David has had enough, as we say here in Arkansas. He's had enough of it. He says to God in righteous indignation, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boast. You realize what he's praying for there, right? He's praying the equivalent, cut out their tongues, Lord, so they can shut up. That's what he's praying. And he hears the empty words, and he he hears the falsehoods. He hears the lack of sincerity and the lack of responsibility that the words are spoken. He sees that words are demeaning, and they're they're meaning, and they, they don't mean what they're saying. And he hears all of this. He says, this is cheap. This is corroding. This is not the way... God created us to communicate. He doesn't need to listen to it. He will not listen to it. And neither should we. When surrounded by lies, we must go to the truth. When we are surrounded by lies, we must go to the truth and we must immerse ourselves in it. Looking and listening To the word of God. As a pastor friend of mine said. We live in a day and age. Where television, internet and written form of the news is so contorted. There's so little truth in it. And yet our people imbibe 
as if it is drink from the gods. And he said, what good is a 30-minute sermon on Sunday to push back against that? I think his point's valid. We need to be in God's Word. And a little bit daily is not going to push back against the flood of contaminating language that heads our way on a daily basis. We've got to go to God's Word, David says, and I love this. He says, the words of the Lord are pure words. It's an intentional redundancy. He says they're, they're like silver refined on the ground, purified seven times. The idea there is that there is this refining process. Scholars say perhaps a hole was dug or whatever the case is, but there is a refinement. But it's, it's seven times. It's the picture of perfection. So perfect is this refining that it is perfection. When we grow accustomed to listening to lies, it's really easy to forget how pure God's Word is. But do you have some of these experiences sometimes when you're, I pray you're in God's Word every day, you're reading God's Word, and you read something, and it's just this. It's, it's doing its work. There are times that my Bible grips me to the point that I fall on my knees in my study. There are times where the Word of God does its work that I cannot get it off my mind. That's the idea that David is using with this simile of silver. Remember that Jesus referred to the Word of God as literally, and I quote, the truth. In a world full of empty talk, smooth talk, double talk, if we want to know the truth, we go to God's breathed out Word. And we go to God's Word and we let it do its work. Teaching us, reproving us, correcting us, training us in righteousness, equipping us for every good work. But you got to be in the Word of God for the Word of God to do its work. And so we push back against the noise of our culture by finding ourselves in the quietude of God's holy Word. At a time when our culture seems to value less and less integrity of language. At a time when we seem to be dismissive of lies and flattery. Well, that's just the way it is. Don't you know? That's political strategy, John. <laughs> well, what I see is be really easy to disconnect what someone says from what they do. How they talk and disconnect it from how they live. Blaise Pascal notes, Man is nothing but insincerity, falsehood, and hypocrisy. Both in regard to himself and in regard to others, he does not wish that he should be told the truth. He shuns saying it to others. And all these moods, so inconsistent with justice and reason, have their roots in the human heart. Which is exactly what Jesus tells us, isn't it? Jesus said, out of the abundance, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, whether good or evil. Because, Jesus said, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. Out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. In other words... When the truth is not told, vileness will be sure to follow from head to heart to hands. That's the way it works. The Hebrew expression, vileness exalted, connotes a flaunting, a promotion. This is what we do, so to speak. And while the wicked may prowl like a predator to plunder the helpless, you can be sure that they will not stay camouflaged. They relish exhibiting their evil ways to promote wickedness as the norm. And also, 
as Paul made the point in Romans chapter 1, and they also want to bring along everybody else with them. I want to encourage you to join me in my, well, my way of life. <laughs> but what they flaunt is not the norm according to God's word. According to God's word, it's perversion. Evil is not an alternative. It's an abomination. It's not an option. It's called iniquity. Not worthy of reward or even acceptance. As Rick prayed earlier, it's deserving of eternal damnation. Such is the sad state of the world where the godly are gone. Where the truth is not told. Where vileness is exalted. And if your attention... If your attention is upon this world, and this is what you focus on, and this is what you look at, and it's depravity, your perspective, let me promise you, will grow darker by the day. Oh, the world. Oh, the world, John. Oh, the world. Oh, it's so, it's so incredibly dark in our day. I'm like, darker than the days of Noah? You think? I don't. Now, I think it's what you look at. I think it's what you pay attention to. But neither you nor I were redeemed to be world watchers. We weren't. We were redeemed to look to the Lord. The believer's perspective is always Christward. Let me say that again. The believer's perspective on all things is always, without exception, Christward. Paul confesses this to the Corinthians, which sounds like hyperbole until you read the rest of Corinthians, in which Paul said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Man, what a great, simple way to live life. Oh, it's called Christianity. <laughs> and looking to the Lord, we are not crying out to the Lord in vain, but to the one who died for us. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we listen not to the lies of the wicked, but we listen to the truth of the gospel. That's why it is so important for us to preach the gospel to ourselves daily. Had he not, had the Lord not, by his grace, by his spirit, convinced us of our sin and misery, had he not enlightened our minds in the knowledge of Christ, had he not renewed our wills, persuading and enabling us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins. But praise God, he has indeed redeemed us. And because we know that he who began a good work in us, he promises to bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. And so, church family, we look to the Lord, knowing He will keep us and guard us both this day and forever. Let's pray. Our gracious God in heaven, You are indeed, as You tell us in Psalm 121, You are our keeper. And You keep us from evil, even amidst wickedness. And we pray that we would in fact immerse ourselves in your word. That we would be people that read your word and study your word and memorize your word. That we would be people that know your word backwards and forwards. We were said as the great preacher that when we are cut, we bleed Bibleine. That we know your word let us be people who speak the truth because we know the truth. And may you be exalted through your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.